Good evening. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees. We'll start by introducing ourselves, and if you care to, please share what you're reading. Kathy, you want to start us off? Yes. So Kathy Loser, and I'm in between books right now. I'm doing a lot of mask making and quilting. So. <laughs> Uh, Fred Reisinger, uh, I am still reading John Meacham's book, The Soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels. Interestingly, it's when hope overcame division or fear th at various times in U.S. history. Figured it's a good time to read it. I'm Marilyn Wood, and I too am between books right now. Feel like I've been reading a lot, but not for pleasure. <laughs> And I'm John Walsh. I'm kind of in between books also, uh, but last night I was reading a short story collection by Andre Dubis, or Dubus, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kari Essary, and I'm revisiting White Fragility with my book club. So. Thank you, everybody. Um, first order of business, do we have a motion to approve this month's consent agenda, which includes minutes of our past meeting, monthly financial report, monthly bills for payment, personnel report, and our 2020 board meeting calendar? John, I have a question for you. Do we want to do the public hearing? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I've skipped a whole meeting. Um, so this is the, I will uh, rescind my previous call to order. This is calling to order the Board of Trustees public hearing on the 2021 budget. Um, so that's our first order of business, uh, public hearing on the 2021 budget. And we'll call Gary to the podium for the summary of our 2021 budget. So I'd like to welcome members of the community to the meeting tonight. Can you hear me okay <laughs> through this mask? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the public hearing for the budget is the library's opportunity to share information about its financial plans for the next calendar year. The hearing is also required by law and must be held at least 10 days before the Library Board of Trustees adopts the budget. The adoption of the budget will take place at the October 21st board meeting. The 2021 budget plan includes long-term consideration <clears throat> for capital improvements in a new branch, as well as continuing to provide support to meet these critical goals. Provide free, equitable, and convenient access to information support reading, 21st century liter literacy skills, and lifelong learning, provide a safe and welcoming place for all, and promote a climate of civility, inclusiveness, and compassion. So in the handout, we don't have a projector tonight, but in the handout, um, I am moving now to the second page, the revenue page. And if you're following online, the packet online, this would be page 23. So the property tax revenue estimate for 2021 is about $6,725,000. And it's based on a growth quotient of 4.2%. It's an increase of about $275,000 from the previous year. Local income tax revenue for next year is projected to decrease by about 10%, which is about $250,000. This is due to the economic impact of COVID-19. 
Another impact of the pandemic has been a reduction to investment income. Rates are very low now because of efforts to stimulate the economy. The rest of the revenue budget includes excise taxes, fees, and rental income. The total operating revenue is projected to be about 9.5 million. In addition to the operating revenue, we also receive about $700,000 in the debt fund to cover the general obligation bond payments uh, for next year. The current general obligation bond will be paid off at the end of 2021. The next page in the handout is the spending side of the budget, and it's page 22 in the online packet. It's actually 23. Okay. The operating fund spending budget is about $9.8 million for next year, an increase of about $342,000. Wages and benefits account for about 69% of the 2021 budget. The wage estimates are based on an increase of 75 uh, cents per hour or 2.75%, whichever is greater. We've used an estimate, estimated increase of 15% for health insurance. A final decision on wage increases will be made after we know what happens with health insurance rates. The other services and charges category includes utilities, communication and marketing, insurance, and repairs and maintenance. It also includes the cost of eBooks and database access for patrons. Part of the reason that the other services and charges category increased by about $257,000 is because of the shift in demand for remote access to library materials, including ebooks and databases. The capital asset category includes the allocation for printed books, magazines, and DVDs. This category decreased by about $120,000. Those funds were reallocated to the funding uh, for ebooks and database access. The combined 2021 collection spending for ebooks, databases, printed books, magazines, and DVDs is about 15% of the operating budget. Total collection spending for next year will be about $1.47 million. So spending in the other funds, <clears throat> we've <clears throat> we also have spending <clears throat> budgeted in the debt fund and the LERF and rainy day fund. We have budgeted about $700,000 in the debt fund to cover general obligation bond payments. The LERF and Rainy Day funds have dollars in the budget, but we don't plan to spend anything in those funds unless we get an unplanned need. The budgeted spending for all the funds for next year is about $11.8 million, which is a 4.2% increase from the uh, 2020 budget. So, Going to the next page, the tax rate page, <clears throat> and uh, this is, let's see, page six <clears throat> in the online packet. So this slide shows the 2021 tax rate compared to previous years back to 2011. The library's tax rate in 2011 was about 11 cents per $100 of assessed value. 
after 2011 and up to now, um, it has averaged close to 10 cents. The breakdown between operating fund and debt fund is about nine cents for the operating fund and one cent for the debt fund. So on an asset with an assessed value of $100,000, a one penny tax rate would amount to $10. The tax rate for the debt fund for 2021 is about nine tenths of a penny. The total tax rate, including the operating fund and debt fund is 9.42 cents. So now we're moving <clears throat> to a look at the long-term finance plan. Uh, the, um, the information in the online packet for the long-range finance plan has been replaced uh, because we got new information after the packet was already published. So the, uh, the packet in the handout is the uh, most current information. Let's see. So the estimated project cost of the new 21,000 square foot branch has been revised <clears throat> since last month. The long-term finance plan and, well, okay, we've gone over that. So there are two uh, branch design options to consider now. Option one is for a single level facility. Option two has a <clears throat> lower level that will include a covered parking area. Option one costs about $150,000 more than the estimate that was done in June 2019. Option two has a cost of a little over $12 million. The cost increase of about a million dollars is because of the added level with covered parking. The last two pages in this, in this handout show the footprint of each option at, bachelor, at the bachelor middle school property. And we'll discuss those in more detail when we go over the branch plan. Uh, so <clears throat> the next page in the handout uh, has some net assessed value data. Uh, when the current GO bond is paid off at the end of 2021, the plan is to replace that bond with a branch bond and a general obligation bond for technology and facility related needs. The plan is to keep the debt fund tax rate at, one, at about one cent and the library total tax rate at about 10 cents. The net assessed value for 2021 is projected to be about $7.9 billion. The debt payment for 2021 will be about $700,000. The net assessed value data on the handout shows a 2022 net assessed value projection of $8 billion a one cent debt fund tax rate would generate about $800,000 uh, for the library at, the, at that level, at $8 billion. That would cover the cost of the bond payments for option one. Option two would result in a 2022 bond payment of about $900,000. The net assessed value chart in the handout shows that by 2026, net assessed value would reach the $9 billion milestone. 
a debt fund tax rate of one cent on $9 billion would generate $900,000 at that point. So option two would mean the tax rate for the debt fund in 2022 would be slightly more than one cent, probably between 1.1 and 1.2 cents to maintain a total tax rate of about 10 cents, the operating budget uh, tax rate would need to be slightly less than nine cents. So the next page in the handout <clears throat> shows how the library's projected cash balances plus the bond proceeds will cover the cost of the two project options. To summarize the numbers, in both options, the library will be issuing two bonds in September of next year. The bond total for option one is $7 million, and the bond payments would be around $800,000. The bond total for option two would be $8 million. And the bond payments would be about $900,000 per year. Gary, can you repeat that? The amount of the, the, the bond would be how much? For option two? For option two. Option two, the bond total would be Eight million, so a, a million more than option one. For the construction loan. For the combined Total loan. construction and yeah, got it. Yes. Um, so at this point, I'm going to open it up for questions about either the 2021 budget or the long-range finance plan. that you had a change from when you put it online versus when you printed it out in terms of the assessed value or the, uh, you, you said you had new information that made a change. The new information was, was basically the, the new cost estimates oh, for the construction. It wasn't the, the prior funding structure then. Pardon? It wasn't a new income coming in or new tax base, right? Um, Right. The, I, I guess the, re, the reason I had to do this packet and change it from what was published is, is because of the, uh, what, what triggered that was the information on the, the two options for the branch construction. So it was just related to the branch construction, nothing changing with a formula or anything like that? No, not really. Okay. It was it's really just t because of the uh, cost estimate. Uh, update for the two options. That's true. There's nothing that has changed in terms of what our income stream mm -hmm. revenue or uh, it's really related to Does anybody anticipated. expect that to change drastically? Well, the, the, the guidance has been that um, reduction to 10% reduction in, in income tax, but it's Gary's done some estimates on our um, are anticipated it's not cash a, flow cash flow mm -hmm. and it's not a, it's not um it's maximum they've changed the name of it so it's not oh it's the growth quotient the growth quotient has a new name right and so okay. we anticipate that to be stable but not raising for okay. but not declining mm -hmm. well so Decreasing. the growth quotient um I'm, i am i am estimating that it will decline in 2022 to about to to about two and a half percent versus current 2021. It's 4.2 percent is the growth quotient. So in my cash flow projections, I've used a, a rough estimate of two and a half percent growth quotient for 2022. And I guess what I would say there is that it's still climbing, it's not falling, uh, but it's not climbing at the same rate 
Okay. Yeah. I have a question here. You mentioned the, the total amount spent on collections and materials, and it was still about 15%. Do you have, I, I don't know if I had my numbers right. It looked to me like it was about 12 and a half percent. Is that wrong or is it? Well, if you, in, if you include the, the lines in the capital asset portion of the budget for books, periodicals, DVDs, and add to that the, the line in the other charges category for databases and eBooks, uh, and it came out to 12% when you did that? Well, I thought you said the total was 1.47 million. That's the amount we're spending. Right, and I, I divided that by the total budget and it came out to 12 and a half. That's, I think that's because oh. that percentage is based on only our operating yeah. budget. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the book budget, will that include um, the books for the new branch, or would that be another year? That's well, another budget line. In the uh, cost estimates for the, the branch project, I think there is a line for collections. Okay, in, in the, in the yeah. whole big deal. We'll in a moment, okay. yeah. Okay. Yep. okay, cool. Eventually, it would be folded into that overall operational budget, but it's not in 2021. So the, um, is a correct summary of the, the extra, if we went with option two with the parking below the facility, it costs about an extra million and we would cover that with a, dish, a, a higher bond? Exactly. Yeah. You mentioned to keep the rate at about 10%, there'd be a year where we'd have to reduce the operating. Uh -huh. Is that something we well, have you, to do by law or that we need to do if we want to keep it at about 10%? That we would need to do to, to keep it in that 10 cent range. Um, it, it, so if you look at the, the rate chart, I mean, in the last several years, uh, the, uh, the operating rate I don't think it hardly ever reaches nine cents. It's it's you know between eight and a half and nine on average. So it's it's generally been lower. So I don't think uh, uh, it'll be any trouble to to stay in that ten cent range. Are there any other questions from the board? Seeing none, I'll ask if there are any members of the public who would like to comment on the 2021 budget. If so, please come to the podium, state your name, and share your comments with us. Seeing none, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. We've adjourned our public hearing on the 2021 budget. And now I will call to order our regular uh, Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees meeting. And we will dispense with introductions since we've already done that. And we'll jump right into the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions, clarifications, corrections to the consent agenda? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And uh, Marilyn, anything you wanna draw our attention to from your monthly report? Yeah, I have a couple of things tonight. And the first one is not in the report, but it is my pleasure to be able to introduce to you this evening, our new associate director, Greer Carson. 
And uh, Greer is one of us, having been at MCPL since 2018. Uh, but he also began his path of librarianship here in Bloomington. He was an undergraduate student at IU, and then he received his MLS from the School of Library and Information Science in 2006. Um, after graduation, uh, Greer's career led him to Lake Forest Academy, a boarding school in Illinois, where he worked his way from librarian to director of libraries and academic technology. There, Greer proposed and implemented a one-to-one -one iPad program, one of the first of its kind in the United States. He recalls that that process was exciting, but also a little scary, uh, a glorified gaming device, which ended up being transformative as an educational tool, and we are all dealing with that right now, so it's, it's uh, very commonplace. Then Greer and his family moved back to Bloomington in 2013 when he became the director of Putnam County Public Library. At Putnam County, Greer oversaw important renovations and expansions and increased outreach efforts. He also developed a training program for new librarians, hiring recent graduates with fresh ideas. In 2018, Greer became access and content manager here at MCPL. He has focused on more atten attention to content and accessibility as opposed to format. And he has overseen the expansion of the Library of Things and the addition of new digital services such as Canopy. Now, uh, in his new position as associate director, I'd like to uh, ask Greer to step to the podium and say a few words. Thank you, Marilyn. Good evening, everyone. I've enjoyed speaking with you a number of times over the past two and a half years in the capacity of Access and Content Services Manager and as a relative newcomer to the MCPL family. And it is now a privilege and an honor to stand before you as the Associate Director of our unique and much loved library. As Marilyn mentioned, I've previously served in administrative and leadership roles in educational and public library settings. And I've been fortunate enough to work with many talented professionals to beat myriad challenges specific to library and technology services. But the challenges we face today, both within Monroe County and throughout our global community, are far greater than most of us have ever faced. What inspires me is the notion that these challenges are perhaps matched only by the talent, passion, and commitment to library service that we have here at MCPL. I am eager to help us meet those challenges, to work with our community as we develop plans for a new branch, to build bridges among library users, and ultimately to support Maryland's vision for reaching each and every individual and family here in Monroe County. So thank you for your support and your partnership, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Greer. Congratulations on the new position, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. You may have seen today in the paper uh, that the library became the fifth location for the Bloomington Mask Drive. We have installed the mask kiosk upstairs in the vestibule and it will be available all of the hours uh, that the library is open. So we're very pleased to be partnering with this group uh, to distribute masks to the community. I'd just like to add that the co-founder of that was one of your former librarians, Nola Hartman. She, and, uh, she was here this morning as we, uh, she and I um, cut the, the ribbon. Um, yes, 43 years, I believe, Nola was here at the library. Um, I'm open for questions on anything else on the director's report. Any questions for Marilyn? Okay. Then we will, um, move on to old business and branch planning. We heard a little bit about some news there already and we'll hear more about that. So tonight um, I would like to review the process and the community and engagement that we have initiated so far in this project just to give you a little bit of a, a timeline and also their trajectory and what we've done so far but then we can walk through the preliminary design and cost information, which just arrived this week. And I laid uh, that packet uh, at each of your desks. So this has been a long process. Uh, our major milestones and reports are posted on our web for everyone to follow. Um, but we've discussed a new 
branch for decades, and library strategic planning and community feedback has both requested and supported a new branch. But it wasn't until April of 2018 when it felt like we took those first concrete steps forward uh, to making this a reality. And that was when the Board of Trustees approved hiring Matthew Architects to conduct a branch feasibility study. And we do have Christine Matthew here tonight to answer any additional questions that you might have about the plan. In the summer of 2018, uh, Matthew Architects began to engage and the library with community stakeholders. Uh, and we, these were in-person discussions that we, that we had uh, with various partners and or community members or organizations to really get their input on what they envisioned in a library and that the, what they felt that the community need, needed from their own organizational uh, connections or personally. And then in September of 2018, we met with Southwest area residents. Uh, these were scheduled community conversations <clears throat> to get the same kind of input on the kind of services, amenities, and location needs that they felt uh, for the new branch. And that information along with the input of 800 Monroe County residents into a survey, uh, some of those were email and phone, uh, provided the input for the branch feasibility uh, plan, which we have and is posted also on the website. In February 2019, the branch study was approved by this board and the library began discussions with a real estate broker to locate a property which met a number of requirements. There were multiple properties which were identified and examined and the requirements that we had were high. Uh, it had to be in a vibrant and growing residential area. Uh, it needed to be near trails and transportation sources in an area with major access to the county and through uh, major roads. It needed to be near schools and community amenities so that we could continue partnerships and access. It had to have the ability for adequate parking. It had to have an infrastructure in place to meet the needs of the library and the community and to reduce costs for building. And it had to be available and at a reasonable cost. The location at Bachelor Middle School site was identified and it met the requirements and no other site did. So the, uh, the library, our broker John West and Monroe County Community School Corporations began discussions about potential land and it was required that appraisals and site surveys were, uh, were completed prior to any negotiations and that work began in the fall of 2019. In October of 2019, the library and the school learned that the county was making changes to the roundabout, which was to be installed on Gordon Pike, and it would ultimately change the property lines, which were then under discussion uh, for the library. So fast forward to March 2020, after the site analysis had been done, and still without knowing what those property lines might be, and or the road might be the library um, board of trustees and MCCSC entered into a sale agreement and we continue to wait on the county's plan. Everything that we had up to this point was conceptual. We did not have property lines uh, nor had any architectural planning taken place up to that point. The information that, uh, that, we, that we are aware of and that has been circulating regarding the impact, impact on trees uh, has been inaccurate because we simply did not have a plan. And then the pandemic, and we didn't have any word uh, for quite a long time. But in July of this year, just a couple of months ago, the library planning team met with county officials to learn of the new street and road layout. And at that point, we could begin to make plans for our own site development. And now I'd like to walk you through what that has brought forward to us. Any questions on our planning up to this point? So going back to that feasibility study, uh, this, this plan uh, takes all of those amenities and things which had been identified in the feasibility study and puts it, it, puts it on paper for us. Um, the land that we identified, um, it, Christine, Matthew, 
Uh, our consultants, Bledsoe, Rigger, Cooper, James, who are civil engineers, and Blundell Associates, the cost consultants, have studied the building and the site. And then through exploration of numerous design strategies, um, we've pinned down a couple of favorable building and design options and their associated costs. And the cost was the last missing link in this until this week. So the options adjust the land parcel boundaries to respond to existing conditions, such as roads, driveways, trees, and topography. So this study uh, allows us and the architectural team uh, to begin to make more, develop more plans for the next phase after we make a decision regarding which option we might like. So under the site and building considerations, uh, this is a 21,000 square foot building. Um, we were working with a budget of around $11 million and those things were established during the feasibility study and that uh, size is based on the programs which had been identified and the needs and amenities that the community supported. So we have requested that all of those services be on a single level. Um, that is primarily based on, on optimizing operations of the facility. Um, we know that in this building, uh, it requires a lot more people to staff a building that's two la layer, la levels than it does a single. So uh, we also know that the Monroe County community has expressed a desire to keep the wooded area, the forest, and the library sees that a majority of these trees are an asset to the location. Um, there are invasive Bradford pear species in that forest and we know and we are, are engaging uh, a, a forester to take a look at the health of the, of the property because should we site a building that close to the, to the forest, we wanna know there aren't any dangers in that and also just to make the forest a greater asset to the community by ensuring that its health is good. So based on the building size and the topography of the land, there are challenges, um, but there are also opportunities for various designs. And so we have two separate ones. And so if you take a look at option one, uh, which is C001 in the packet, uh, this is a conceptual plan uh, for the first site option. That option has parking on both the east and the west side of the building with the building in the center. And the building is a single le level. There are pros and cons uh, to this, as you might imagine. Uh, the library faces Gordon Pike and there's a driveway that links the two parking areas. And the, uh, this, the building is sited um, on the southwest corner of the lot. Um, if you look at the first drawing, you can see the, it's, it's a bit of an overlay so that you can see the trees um, below it so that you can see where the, the building is sited and, and the limited um, impact on the trees in this option. Again, this is conceptual. Uh, the, the, the sight lines themselves are still to be determined. And, uh, and all of this will still have to be approved um, through the county before we would make a purchase. The second option is a library, and this one, again, that, that funny color, um, if you go to option two. I can't lick my fingers, so it takes me more time to turn pages. So this is an option uh, that has a, uh, it actually has two levels, but the lower level is a covered garage. And so this, um, again, it's, it's located uh, on the southwest corner near the road facing Gordon Pike, uh, a similar access to the, to the building uh, from the west. But there's less surface parking because we've gained that parking underneath in the garage. Um, and uh, the, it takes advantage of the topography. So we essentially drive um, into the, to the hillside that's, that's there. Um, so we're tucking a garage under the main building, but we do expect that given the Monroe County, there will be rock there. So there will be some considerations that we might have in, in digging. Um, this one um, has the 
the the value of reducing the amount of trees that might um, be taken out as well as uh, reducing surface parking. And from a library perspective and use operationally, uh, we can drive into that parking garage and have cover um, if we're unloading materials in it and it saves um, for snow removal and other things because there's less parking. And elevator. there will be an elevator, yes. There is an elevator um, located uh, in the garage uh, and ac accessible from the east side or in the garage uh, for people, uh, both staff and others. So that's it's a and it's a, an additional exit as well. Is it going to be a service elevator just for like the materials or no? No, it's for it's, everyone. It's for sharing with everything. Right. So anyone who's in the garage parking can use the elevator. It's a passenger elevator. The, the access and loading materials will be shared with the patrons. It could be, mm -hmm. we, but it would necess we don't necessarily anticipate that that would be the place that we would unload. It's a place that we could unload should we need the cover. Uh -huh. But but the the west side of the building, um, there's a staff entrance there, a drive, and it's also an area where books that are being transferred be, um, between branches mm -hmm. would go to be. That's where the um, the material handler system would be, so it would go there first. Now, the there is in this plan. Um, Good roundabout here. It exists. No. 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 Not yet. Not, okay. That no, it is what we've been waiting, what we were waiting on to find out how it would impact. Yes. Okay. Is this accurate now to what it will be? That's. As far as Yes, that's they. I don't remember what the percentage was, but we spoke with the, those who were from the county who were working on it, and they felt that it was mm -hmm. what we would get. And the school building is on the other side of the trees. Uh, oh, oh, north. Uh, okay. And regardless of whether you do one or two, the entrance is always going to be to that other, it's always going to be the same entrance. Right, it's the southwest mm -hmm. side. Southwest, okay. But if you came in from the lower level, right. there's also mm -hmm. an entrance. So the the uh, interior layout is is here in terms of contiguous spaces and Primarily, again, this is conceptual. This is primarily to ensure that everything fits. Uh, the the layout itself is still under discussion, and nothing is nailed down. I mean, obviously, we're we still don't have a plan. This is we're we're just identifying options here. So tonight, this is just a discussion and an opportunity for us to ask questions and, and ask Christine if we have other questions about how this layout works or specifics. Um, uh, we will have to decide on this in the next couple of weeks. There is uh, a timeline that I've also attached there and it's, it's extensive, but for us, uh, we have to make a decision on this so that we can continue to move it toward the county because we have to submit a subdivision plan and a and a site um, I don't know what they call it but the county has to approve two different things before we can move forward so we'll have a board meeting between now and our next regular we will have scheduled. a special board meeting <clears throat> mm -hmm. to to approve an option is there any um, if we decide to spend the extra million to do the underground parking for its advantages, or not underground, but right. lower level parking for its advantages, is there any advantage to tentatively approving both in case one, you know, that one doesn't get approved for some reason, or is there any reason? You mean from the county's perspective? Yeah. Um, they only want one plan to look at, presumably. They, yeah, if they yeah. want a single plan. They want to know what we want to do, mm -hmm. and then they would approve that. So we will know 
uh, before, before we make any purchase of property or anything. We'll, all of those things will be worked out and approved. I'm looking at this page uh, that has the first floor plan. Uh-huh. Of the, it. what's the page number? Um, I don't see a page number. It says A201, and it says first floor plan. And would that plan change if, if we, between, would it be any different if we use the basement approach? No. No, the first yes. floor would remain the same. Okay. That's the good. only difference would be in terms of of uh, Where the elevator came up. <laughs> of the elevator, right, and and lower level up. So but, moving the parking underneath does not change what we plan to do with upstairs. the building itself. Right. Yeah. Is the is, is one of the criteria for putting a parking under the first level? to save trees? That's one of the reasons, yes. Okay. Yeah, we're trying to work with the community um, and, so and meet all of those needs. We have an estimate of really how many trees, if there are invasive Bradford pears, if they're all, I mean, it seems to me that for me thinking through this process, if that whole area where the parking would be and it's all one level and no parking under the first level, if the majority of those trees are Bradford pears, that it's a moot point that we would have to redesign and put something under the first levels, correct? Uh, in terms of the trees, mm -hmm. but yet there's still value in reducing street, or excuse mm, me, surface, surface, parking. surface parking. And, and, and Christine could uh, speak to this, but I think there's also considerations in terms of, of runoff mm -hmm. and um, um, you know, the my other question also mm -hmm. is, if we're thinking of a parking garage, basically, is what it is, right? Yes. Those have ongoing maintenance issues. And just from having experience yeah. with that one it over there, yeah. yeah, and it's like, eee, I'm not, I don't have a good sense of how much that is going to cost us in the long run. Well, I think ultimately the answer is is that if we're structurally sound, it won't be that it won't be yeah. in comparison to, to the other one. Um, Christine and I actually had a short conversation about this yesterday, and and in terms of, of cost at the beginning, now over time uh, you have to resurface surface mm -hmm. lots, you have to repaint, mm -hmm. you have to have extensive lighting, uh, you have to remove snow and mm -hmm. all of those other things. There's got to be some maintenance cost to th mm -hmm. that inside, but I don't think it's, it's certainly not on an ongoing basis at the same level. And, and uh, if we're structurally sound, yeah, we should be okay. That was what I was thinking about. We wouldn't have that problem if we simply had parking yeah. upstairs or on the ground, on the ground level. But you would have drainage par par issues, correct? From a garage or from? Yeah, from uh, underground, or not underground. Can, can you speak to that, yeah. Christine, about drainage? Especially in, in Monroe County with limestone. <laughs> there will likely be um, uh, retention ponds of some sort, um, or the water will be carried, will be carried, excuse me? A retention pond would be within walking distance from the school? I may be, I, I'm, I'm not the civil engineer oh, on this, okay. so we haven't gone that far, but I know that the EPA requires that the water be taken care of. Any surface water would have to be taken care of. So, so you have to have a retention pond or, or, at or an underground system that okay. carries that water to okay. a place where it's managed. Um, if there not was. necessarily a retention pond, but you have to manage the water, okay. any water that, that comes off and, and uh, Bill Rigert's group is looking at that and what the requirements would be for this project. Have they looked at like surface parking that's permeable? I mean, there's many options um, out there. We haven't, we're really just digging into this right now, but that's certainly something to take into consideration. There is cost, um, obviously a major cost factor with doing that, but there are also some really good things that come out of it, which is less uh, uh, water management. So these are the things that we're looking at. The um, uh, certainly, and uh, the garage is something that sort of came about 
it was sort of like a light bulb went off in our heads because um, looking at the tree situation on the site and then looking at where there's an open field, um, it made perfect sense to take the building and tuck it to the south end of the property um, where it not only uh, works from the standpoint of an open field versus having to remove trees, but it's also very visible to the public. And that's one of the main things that, one of the things we talked about during the feasibility study, that you wanted something that really faced Gordon Pike if you could, um, or whatever street you put the building on, um, so that it became part of everybody's, you know, they drove by it, they recognized it, it's an institution, it's part of the community. So that came out of that process too. Um, but the hill, you know, there's a pretty, um, it's, a, it's a gradual hill, but there's a drop. There's a drop of about 15 feet between the upper level of the building and the lower level. A perfect, it's a perfect <laughs> drop from the standpoint of coming in for a garage, because if you add the head height plus the structure, um, you're at about 15 feet. So, um, uh, and then you don't have the water runoff problem, obviously, from the garage. That's all self-contained. Um, so there are some great advantages. I mean, there are, the disadvantages are the fact that it's a more expensive um, upfront cost. Um, both uh, situations have maintenance. Um, uh, the question is, uh, we would have to do a further study to find out what the difference is between those um, two levels of maintenance. But um, I'd be curious to know um, the research out there or what what is now permeable parking services. If it's what's There's the a, cost advantage or is it mm -hmm. about the same cost mm -hmm. as basically building a garage? I would, be, I would just be interested to know. Mm -hmm. There's a great example of permeable um, parking services that have ju has just been put in over at Switchyard Park. Um, and I can find out uh, the cost on that from the city. Um, I'm curious, is it going to be less costly to do that than to build the garage? Or is the garage a cheaper option than permeable? I don't know. Um, currently, the cost estimate is I don't think um, Blundell put in permeable necessarily. I don't know what they've put in. Um, but um, we would have to take it and ask them if that would increase more cost. Well, the initial so. cost is also has to be compared to the long term cost. The garage is going to cost this money mm -hmm. much more. What, whether, the, whether the paving is permeable or not, we are still required uh, to follow the law in terms of water management. And the EPA has become, uh, it's been a very rigorous process. Um, so uh, that they go through. And, and uh, Bill Rigert's office is very aware of that, and there's a lot involved in managing the water. So, you know, if you can reduce the amount of paving at grade, mm -hmm. uh, so much the better, you know. But, um, you know, other things come along with putting it under the garage. The one thing that's really nice is that in both plans, um, we've put a stair on the south side of the building that will carry, they'll go along with the terrain. It's not just a fire stair, it's a stair that will bring you up so that when you do enter the building at the low level, you feel like you're in the library immediately. And you come up and it's an open stair. We envision sort of landings having seating areas as you move up through the building. And the advantage of that um, is that if you're coming in from the parking garage, again, you don't feel as if you're just coming up a fire stair, but you're coming into the library at that level. The other advantage is um, that on the east side, the low side of the site, um, we can, uh, you know, during the feasibility study, uh, the library, people talking about the library um, expressed a desire to have programs outside as well as inside. And the, this site is really a wonderful site for that. <clears throat> if we do um, have the garage under there, you would have immediate access to an open area of site at the east side where um, people envisioned being able to read outdoors, having uh, summer programs for kids, um, nature walks. You know, there are things that are literally connected very tightly with what's going on in that particular site. So we see, as Marilyn mentioned before, we really see the trees as part of that experience of the building. So, 
One other advantage that I'll add to this is that um, effectively we're gaining about 21,000 square feet on the lower level. So it's cheap square feet underneath. We don't have much storage in this, in this building, mm -hmm. uh, but we could add additional storage spaces uh, on, the, on the lower level that would uh, not come at the cost as they would on to either opportunity cost or real cost on the second level. That's a very that's a very good point. And um, you know, if we didn't put the parking garage underneath, because of that 15 foot drop, we would basically have to backfill all of that, mm -hmm. at least halfway back. So we're talking about taking fill and infilling that under the building. Um, and um, in terms of the cost, looking at the difference between the two, it comes out for the to have the um, parking garage it ends up being $46 a square foot, you know, for the parking garage, which is, you know, if, if you're aware of any kind of construction numbers, that's very low. Um, because we save the amount of money that it would require to put in all that fill. We still have the retaining walls, no matter what we do. The retaining walls are there no matter what. So I'm sounding like I'm preaching here, but um, obviously I have a leaning on which one, uh, because it's such a green, uh, it's such a green project, but there's also money involved. So it's, a, it's still a choice. Any other questions that I might be able to answer? Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you. So that is um, all I have to present. Any other comments or questions for Marilyn or anyone else on the branch planning? And um, because this is so new mm -hmm. and we don't have a quorum, we work <laughs> now, uh, it, we didn't want to have to make a decision tonight, but we will have a need a board meeting between now and the next next month to, to move things forward and make a decision on this. Um, our next item is another um, update on strategic roadmap planning. Yes, and so I just want to bring you up to date where we are. The strategic uh, roadmap team has been working uh, throughout the summer, and I'm very pleased to say that we had uh, 2,669 survey responses from the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and a, in addition to that, we had 14 conversations with, uh, uh, with community partners, stakeholders, organizations, and all of that information is being analyzed uh, and themes are emerging um, for, that we'll be taking uh, forward to uh, develop new goals as well as actionable plans. So at this point, uh, the team is, is working on, on looking at the themes, um, developing some goals, even if, if they need to change from what we currently have, uh, and then uh, turning those on over to the leadership team uh, to identify actionable goals for 2021. And then uh, further on, after we do that, um, we will be submitting a report to the Board of Trustees before the end of, of this year, and then it'll go on to the Indiana State Library as part of our, our um, standards. Any questions or anything that you'd like to know about the themes that are emerging? The themes. themes that are emerging. So a lot of, we have been um, sorting them into four categories. They're broad, uh, collections, services, programs, and marketing. And for collections, as you might imagine, particularly during this time when people are taking the survey, there's a lot of, a lot of requests for more eBooks or e-audio specifically. Um, people are requesting a little bit more breadth uh, in the collections in terms of specific genres or subjects, more, more of each title, uh, more library of things items, anywhere from baking equipment to tools. Uh, and services, there, there are a lot of, of positive comments about opening a new branch, and some of them have been very specific to the proposed location. Uh, more, re or excuse me, requests for more bookmobile stops and offsite services, and also 
social services on site, some even calling for a social worker. Um, on the programming side, especially children's programs on the weekends and evenings, more adult programming, gardening, sustainability, DIY. And regardless of the age, there, uh, there have been many requests for additional technology or advanced technology and programming in STEAM. And then in marketing and our website, um, there have been requests for easier navigation within the library for signage uh, and better promotion of our online service where people are still unaware of some of the things that we provide. A couple follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. um, with the, the topic, the theme of maker space mm -hmm. stuff and technology, before COVID, how popular were those things uh, in our programming relative to other stuff? Popular. Yeah. And I think that even now we're attempting to do uh, some of that virtually uh, and just helping people. And those are some of the most popular ones, how to make a mask, you know, just from that more analog, not technology, but just a, a DIY makerspace. And how common is it to have a social worker at a library? It's becoming more and more common. Uh, certainly some have been around for a number of years, but I think that there are many libraries that are considering it. And we have um, an ongoing uh, partnership with IU School of Social Work and uh, a professor at IUPUI as we do some um, looking into ways that we might be able to bring interns in and really test the water for what we would get from it. I mean, we had Centerstone here for, for several years and after their grant ran out, we haven't ha had any. And we think that perhaps that would be really good even, even in Ellettsville, particularly with our teens. Yeah, I was wondering in, when there is a social worker present, is that a library employee or does a library host somebody from another agency? It's worked both ways, but I think that it's moving more toward being a library employee. Any other questions on the um, survey or other strategic planning activity? Thank you, Marilyn, and thanks to everybody involved in that effort. Um, it's a lot of work and we appreciate it. Is there any uh, new business? Okay, then our last item before public comment is update from uh, Brian with Building Services and Security. Good evening, my name is Brian Leibacher. I'm the Building Services and Security Manager. Um, big title for basically I, I manage the, um, the custodians, the security officers, and the maintenance personnel here at, at the library. And um, so this is my opportunity to uh, kind of pat ourselves on the back as far as a, a library and as a, as a building services team. Um, uh, the first thing I can say about our security department at this point in time is that security bands are the lowest that they have ever been in the past six months. Uh, because we haven't had any patrons here really. But um, uh, aside from that, um, uh, the security presence right, right now is, 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 is just as critical as, as ever. Um, there's a lot of anxiety out there right now, as you can imagine. Um, it, we've all seen the videos of uh, people going into commercial places where they're requiring masks and they don't want to wear a mask and it turns into a spectacle. Um, and so having a security presence here, I know, is a, is, is a great peace of mind for our staff. Um, we have not had, had any incidents of that, um, uh, which I'm happy to say. And so uh, we hope that that trend uh, continues. The, um, one security issue we did have over the summer that kind of caught us off guard, um, and I'm kind of taking this opportunity to, to thank another community partner we have here. Um, somebody cut our American flag down for some unknown reason. Um, and we were scratching our heads trying to figure out how we were going to get the flag without a rope um, back up to the top of the flagpole. So we called the fire department. The fire department uh, came out uh, within a week and uh, using their ladder truck, they were able to help us um, run a new line and get, our, get our, our, our flag back up. So I wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge, acknowledge them. 
on the building services front um, from our 2020 list of projects um, to some of our major milestones that we've completed. Um, we, um, we paved uh, or sealed in uh, the Ellettsville back parking lot. We uh, sealed the front parking lot here at the uh, downtown library. We replaced some windows in the teen center at the Ellettsville library. We added um, a few automatic door openers around the building, performed our annual chiller maintenance. We replaced two water fountains here with bottle fillers. We uh, replaced two sewer ejector pumps and we upgraded our HVAC controls, um, our, our heating and cooling controls. Um, that particular line item, I'm happy to say, came in about $30,000 under, uh, under what we had thought it might cost. Some ongoing projects that we've still got, we're still rep uh, pursuing replacement of an exterior egress door at the teen center. There's two projects that we've deferred for this year. One is our annual deep carpet cleaning. That's because we just haven't had the patron traffic that we would normally have, so we've deferred that and an attempt to save a little money, and also a privacy fence at Ellisville. We've deferred that. Since we've been shut down since March, um, uh, the maintenance department has uh, stripped wallpaper, primed and repainted uh, 9,800 square feet of wall, which is a lot. We're currently working on another 500 square feet um, our, of our learn and play space. There we were not able to peel wallpaper because behind the wallpaper there was cork board. Um, so we actually had to replace drywall over the top of that. So drywall has been placed, it's been mudded, now we're getting ready to paint and finish up that part of the project. The custodians uh, have done a deep cleaning of both our Ellettsville branch and our main downtown library here twice. We did one um, initially after closing uh, just to kind of do a deep clean there. And then we did a second round just before we, before we brought all the staff back. We did a, a second round of cleaning there. I know over the, some of the previous uh, board meetings, Marilyn has kept you up to date on a uh, remediation project we were doing at our Kirkwood entrance. So that, that is nearly complete. Um, working with uh, access and content, namely Greer. Uh, we have installed uh, several new shelves around the building to uh, adapt and to pivot in our, in our new climate, uh, mainly for our increased hold situations. Thus far, we've installed 26 pieces of plexiglass uh, around our main uh, library here. And we've also installed an additional 22 uh, partitions, such as these kind of in this room here, We've installed an additional 22 uh, partitions between here and Ellettsville as well. We're moving as much as we can to become touch-free. Uh, we've adopted some uh, touch-free hand sanitizer dispensers at Ellettsville and our downtown libraries. We've added in more automatic doors. We've added some uh, foot door operators, things you've probably seen these around. We've installed a few here where that you push or pull on a door to close it so that you don't have to touch it with your, with your hands. We are moving towards a, a touch-free paper towel and soap dispensers as well. Uh, between our downtown and Ellettsville location, we've replaced 27 uh, toilet seats. We've added uh, toilet seats that have lids. Uh, there's, there's been a demand to have that um, for flushing. And one last major project that we hope to accomplish, that we should accomplish be, um, prior to the 28th, maybe whenever we kick off phase four, um, is an upgrade to our HVAC system, where we would add some ionizers in, into, in, into this. And the, um, the ionizers, um, the way that they kind of work is um, they, they uh, release uh, positive and negatively charged ions into, uh, into our airflow, which then um, have been shown to negate things like uh, mold, and um, allergens and viruses and bacteria. So that is a uh, major project that we are looking at, at taking on here very, very shortly. Is that it? That is it, I think. That, that's quite a bit. <laughs> um, any questions for Brian? At the menu for all the jobs that you've been getting done, especially stripping wallpaper and painting. Yeah. <laughs> Your, um, <laughs> report illustrates well we've you know not just been sitting around while we're waiting for the public to come back but taking advantage of uh, what we can do in this interim and get things even uh, better and nicer for when things return back to normal so thank you for 
all your work and your staff for all their work. Thank you. Okay, um, we had a very full meeting. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's now time for public comment. If there are any members of the public who would like to address the board, please come to the podium, state your name, and share your comments with us. Seeing none, do we have a motion to adjourn? We have a, two motions and two seconds. All in favor, please say aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody.